So very good evening and a warm welcome to all the speakers, panelists, and the delegates. I welcome you all to the sixth edition of Tugs Endoscopy Academic Webinar. I am Dr. Bhavneet Bhalla. I am the uh, Chief uh, <clears throat> Coordinator for Tugs Endoscopy. And today I, along with Dr. Parth, who is also a member of the Tugs Executive uh, Committee, will be moderating this session for you. Now, before we begin our academic session, I would like to mention that today, the 2nd of October is the birth anniversary of Mahatma Gandhi, which is celebrated as Gandhi Jayanti in India and as International Day of Nonviolence by the United Nations. This is in honor of Mahatma Gandhi's legacy of nonviolence and universal brotherhood. We pay our respect to the great man. Now, coming back to the proceedings of the day, so today's session is about the role of endoscopy in the management of GI strictures. So we have with us a group of eminent surgeons and gastroenterologists who will share their experience on this topic with us. So we'll be having two talks, which will be followed by a Q&A session and panel discussion. Now I request you all to type your queries or comments in the chat box, and we will put them across to the experts. I would now like to introduce our panelists for the session. So our first panelist is Professor Vishwanath. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you here, sir. Dr. Vishwanath is a senior consultant surgeon and a professor of surgery at James Cook University Hospital, United Kingdom. Professor Vishwanath has special interest in upper gastrointestinal laparoscopic and endoscopic surgery. He's credited to establish the Streta Center, which is the endoscopic anti-reflux radiofrequency treatment center in the United Kingdom. And he has also introduced the RESTEC pH studies to investigate and manage patients with GERD. Professor Vishwanath is actively involved in the teaching and training programs and is also examiner for MRCS and FRCS. He was conferred with the honorary professorship by the TSEED University Cleveland, United Kingdoms in 2018. Thank you so much for joining, Professor. Thank you. Pleasure. Our second panelist for the session is Dr. Satish Mitta, who is a senior consultant surgeon and GI endoscopist from Ranchi with over 26 years of experience. So he's a passionate endoscopist and has conducted many training programs for GI endoscopy in our country. He has held leadership positions in numerous national societies and is currently serving as honorary secretary of the Indian Association of Gastrointestinal Endoscopic Surgeons. Welcome, Professor uh, Satish. We welcome you to this session. Our third panelist for the day is a close friend of mine, Dr. Ravinder Goel, who is a consultant gastroenterologist with over 15 years of clinical experience. He is a former assistant professor from the Department of Gastroenterology, TGI Chandigarh, and he has special interest in the evaluation and management of GI strictures. Welcome, Dr. Ravinder. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Okay, I would now like to invite our first speaker for the day. Our first speaker is Dr. Arunima Verma. She is a surgical gastroenterologist and advanced GI endoscopist, and is currently heading the Department of Surgery at Tata Motors Hospital at Jharkhand. Dr. Arunima also has a distinct honor of being the first lady president of the Jharkhand State Chapter of Association of India. She'll be talking about the endoscopic management of GI strictures today. Dr. Arunima, over to you. The screen is yours. Thank you for that kind introduction, Dr. Bhalla. I'll start my talk. So my screen is visible. Yes, Dr. Arunima. Please go ahead. So uh, warm greetings from India. And uh, besides what Dr. Bhalla said, it's also the Shara time in India. So happy the Shara to all of you. I shall be talking about endoscopy in GI strictures, mostly the management part. And in today's presentation, I would be covering what are GI strictures, the endoscopic management of varied GI strictures, and what does evidence say? So intestinal stricture is defined as any abnormal narrowing of the bowel lumen, and it can be both benign and malignant and can occur in any part of the GI tract. 
Restriction can lead to a spectrum of narrowing from subtle to complex, and that can result into symptomatic or asymptomatic strictures. So symptomatic ones may be bowel obstructive symptoms, and it will depend upon the degree of stricture, the general medical condition of the patient, the pain tolerance, and the psychological conditioning and deconditioning of the patient. So the approach to GI structures would be having two aims. One is the goal of management and what are the treatment options available? So the goal of management is to re-establish an adequate and durable luminal patency, which should be sufficient to resolve the presenting clinical symptoms. And the options would be medical, endoscopic, and surgical. And each of these will have multiple options in itself. But the best treatment modality for any patient depends on multiple factors, which includes the type of the stricture, the location, complexity of the stricture and preference of the treating physician along with the availability of the treatment options at that particular center. There would be certain relevant information that you would like to gather about strictures before proceeding with the management of these strictures. They are like uh, degree of stricture. We, when we talk about degree of stricture, it could be no stricture. There could be mild, and this is an endoscopic kind of classification. So mild when there is mild resistance to passage of scope, moderate when there is moderate resistance and severe when there is a pinhole stricture which cannot be traversed by the endoscope. You also need to know the characteristic of the stricture. It could be ulcerated, web-like, spindle-shaped, angulated, and the symmetry may be circumferentially or longitudinally asymmetric. Also, the GI strictures in the GI tract are not single. At times, they may be multiple and also complex. So they could be uh, complex associated with fistula and or abscess or pre-stenotic luminal dilatation. All this is very important to know before you proceed with the management of the GI stricture. So coming to the endoscopy in GI strictures, this is a basic slide which we should know that benign stricture and malignant stricture for benign stricture, endoscopy is therapeutic. While for malignant one, it is usually a kind of palliation or bridging between surgery. The advantages of uh, minimal access surgery are present if we are using it as a therapeutic one for benign stricture because there is less pain, early return to work, and it's a scarless procedure, but will need repetitive procedures in most of the cases. In malignant stricture, the first line treatment still remains surgery, chemotherapy, and radiotherapy, and endoscopy should only be considered for unfit patients or those with very less life expectancy. Coming to esophageal strictures. So the esophageal strictures, the incidence is as low as 1.1 per 10,000 person years. And the types, as already mentioned, would be benign and malignant with the benign, in the case of benign, endoscopic dilatation being the gold standard management and in malignant, the surgical chemotherapy and radiotherapy. The benign strictures can again be simple. When simple, it means less than two centimeter in length and straight and complex when it is longer than two centimeter, tortuous or irregular in shape. And the etiologies of both are multiple. Like uh, for benign, few are reflux-related benign uh, peptic strictures, post-surgical anastomotic strictures, caustic injuries, eosinophilic esophagitis, drug-induced radiation, iatrogenic, and so forth. In malignant, you will have either primary adenocarcinoma or squamosal carcinoma, depending upon the site. And also, at times, there may be extension from the lung carcinomas, or there might be a compression due to mediastinal lymph node enlargements. We also need to know some definitions of endoscopic management when dealing with such strictures. So when we talk about uh, endoscopic strictures, uh, for endoscopic therapy is the cornerstone treatment for esophageal, uh, benign esophageal strictures. And the success rate ranges from 70 to 90%, but 40% of these patients would require more than three dilatation sessions. So there is something called a refractory stricture and there is something called a recurrent stricture. So a refractory stricture is one where there is inability to successfully achieve a diameter of 14 millimeter over five sessions of dilatation, which are done at two weekly intervals. While when uh, the recurrent strictures are those which are uh, when you have an inability to maintain an adequate luminal patency of 14 millimeter after achieving it for uh, two, four weeks. So if the stricture is occurring before four weeks, then it becomes a refractory stricture. We have a large armamentarium, I'm sorry, we have a large armamentarium of uh, endoscopic uh, uh, facilities. So it ranges from esophageal dilatation, where you use boogies, which can both be plastic or metal boogies. Balloon dilators, where it could be set diameter or sequential expansion to multiple diameter boogie, uh, balloon dilators or CRE balloon dilators. There can be intralesional injection with steroid or mitomycin C. 
There's a variety of esophageal stents available, which are like self-expanding metal stents, self-expanding plastic stents, biodegradable stents, and a later version of luminoposing metal stents. The latest in the latest in this therapy is the endoscopic incisional therapy where you use needle knives and flexible endoscopic scissors. So what does literature say? Boogies versus balloon dilator for dilatation for esophageal benign structure. This was a systematic review and meta-analysis including five RCTs, total of 461 patients, of which 151 treated with boogie dilatation and 225 with balloon. So results showed that symptomatic relief, recurrence, bleeding, and perforation rates had no difference. However, post-procedure pain was uh, less in the balloon dilatation group. So the only advantage of uh, balloon dilatation group was post-procedure pain, but however, the balloon dilatation is more expensive compared to the boogie dilatation because boogies can be used multiple times and uh, you know it goes on from years to years. However, balloon need frequent replacement because they do burst. Looking at the guidelines for esophageal dilatation, three parts are very important, patient preparation, dilatation guidelines, and post-dilatation uh, care. So in patient preparation, confirmation of indication and ruling out contraindication is primary. Pre-dilatation investigations, that is a endoscopic uh, diagnosis or a contrast radiology, which can be a water-soluble contrast, barium enema, or CT can should be done. Information and consent is mandatory. Four to six hours pre-procedure fasting should be done. Topical anesthesia, sedation, and analgesia are given as pre-medication and uh, uh, sedation and topical anesthesia together should ideally be avoided because they increase the re rate of re uh, regurgitation as well as uh, complications. Anticoagulants, if the patient is on anticoagulants, do stop it five to six days before the procedure and can be restarted five to seven hours after procedure. Antibiotics should be considered in patients who are risk at risk of endocarditis. So uh, when we talk about the dilatation guidelines, it should not be done by beginners. At least 300 to 500 diagnostic procedures should have been done by the endoscopist before the endoscopist takes up this procedure. And uh, the best result is when a luminal diameter of 13 to 15 millimeter is achieved. Single large dilator can be passed safely in simple, uncomplicated structure, but usually a graded approach is recommended in patients with tight, tough, or complex strictures. Graded approach means that you, know, you use a thinner boogie and then you go ahead with the uh, uh, larger diameter boogies. Via guided or endoscopically controlled techniques using the radiographic screening should be added whenever the stricture is tortuous or complex or associated with large hiatal hernia or diverticulae or when you are finding difficulty in passage of guide wires. So here, fluoroscopic guidance is recommended. Post dilatation, after dilatation, it is not over. The procedure is not over because you need to follow these patients closely because uh, these patients may have complications like perforation, bleeding, which may need hospitalization. Uncomplicated cases can be performed as an outpatient procedure. However, the complicated ones or where you have a suspicion of perforation with the patient developing pain, breathlessness, or tachycardia or fever in the post-operative or post-dilatation period, you should perform minimum a chest X-ray and if needed a CT to rule out perforation. Intralational steroid injection uh, acts by the mechanism of post-dilatation uh, inflammatory response by reducing the collagen formation. And this leads to less fibrosis and less chronic scarring. Here, the technique used is injecting triamcillone acetonide endoscopically by using a, a standard sclerotherapy needle. And it is injected in four quadrants of the stricture, 20 to 40 milligrams into each quadrant. And it should be considered in patients with benign short esophageal strictures or where inflammation is the underlying cause, like in peptic strictures. It should not be used in radiation-induced stricture. And three to five sessions of boogie or balloon dilatation should have been performed before you consider the steroid injections in patients. Looking at another meta-analysis of the efficacy of intralational steroids, 11 articles were reviewed, of which 343 patients who had undergone 235 uh, uh, cases of intralational steroid injection, of which 229 were controls. In them, periodic dilatation index was compared in four studies, and it showed that uh, there was a significant improvement of uh, periodic dilatation index in the steroid group. However, the total number of repeat dilatation was found to be comparable in five studies and so showed no significant difference in others. The dysphagia score was also comparable in five studies and did not improve in the rest after these injections. So the conclusion was intralational steroid injection increases the time between endoscopic dilatation 
of benign refractory esophageal stricture. However, its potential known, uh, role needs to be further evaluated. Coming to mitomycin C injection, it is an antifibrotic agent that inhibits collagen synthesis. And here again, either the rubbing technique or the injection technique can be used. And it is second line to steroids. But it requires a certification because it's a chemotherapeutic agent and there are multiple side effects as well. Coming to the most uh, used, that is the endoscopic stents, the concept of use of stent is to secure the patency of the stricture for a longer period of time to achieve permanent tissue remodeling. The types of stent I have already mentioned, the outcome depends on choosing the right stent material and the length. And the length should ideally be uh, five centimeters more than the stricture on either side. And the optimal duration of stent placement also depends upon the length, complexity, and severity of the stricture. For strictures longer than five centimeters, stent should stay in place for eight to 16 weeks. And for shorter ones, it can be lesser period. A meta-analysis on uh, esophageal stents for benign refractory stricture, where eight studies with 199 patients showed uh, that there was significant difference in dysphagia improvement for patients with polyflex stent versus the nitinol stent. And uh, patient sex, age, corrosive etiology, stricture location, stricture length, time of removal, and duration of follow-up had no significant influence on outcome. Migration rate was 26.4. So uh, for the efficacy of uh, self-expanding removable metal stents, the, uh, uh, the placement in benign refractory stricture success rate was 46.2, associated with 26.4 migration rate. And temporary stents could successfully be removed in 87% patients. So it is definitely a good prospect for dealing with patients who have refractory strictures. Endoscopic incisional therapy is the latest where you use uh, this is used to treat the refractory strictures, especially those like Satarsky's rings and anastomotic strictures after gastroesophageal surgery, where radial electrocautery incisions are used. Also in use are polypectomy snares, argon plasma coagulation, and uh, for the uh, electrocautery, needle knives or scissors are available. Incisional therapy is carried out through multiple radial electrosurgical incisions, which is applied to the strictures by controlled software, which is fractionated by a pure, pure cut or blended mode. And radial incision is a promising technique and it combines eight to 10 radial incision using a needle knife. And the mucosa in between, that is the mucosa, in fact, the stricture is resected. So this method comes with challenging with long uh, segment strictures, so it's more useful for the short segment strictures. And a little more on this would be talked about in the colonic part, so I would go ahead with this. Just coming to an algorithm for treatment of esophageal stricture. Once you have esophageal stricture, you can start with a boogie or balloon dilatation for three to five sessions. If it is refractory, then you can consider which type of stricture is it. If it is inflammatory, go ahead with intralesional uh, steroid injection for three sessions. If it does not um, respond, you can go to topical mitomycin application. If again, there is problem, then you go ahead with temporary stent placement and then move ahead to self-dilatation or surgery. For anastomotic strictures or Satarsky or needle knife -like incision therapy should be considered just after it has been seen to be benign, uh, it's a very refractory one. And these also, you can go ahead with temporary stent placement and then finally consider surgery. Uh, though ecclesia cardia is not a kind of stricture, just to mention because it usually presents as a stricture. So here, the armamentarium includes endoscopic injection of botulinum toxin, pneumatic dilatation by, of the lower esophageal sphincter, POEM, which is a technique uh, which is nowadays used very well by, at uh, tertiary centers, stenting and ethanolamine oleate injection. These are the various techniques used for echelasia cardia. Coming to the gastric and duodenal strictures, there are a lot of causes of uh, the benign gastric outlet strictures like uh, peptic ulcer disease, caustic ingestion, chronic pancreatitis, Crohn's disease, and so forth. So it could either be benign or malignant conditions that cause the gastric outlet obstruction. And you have to first uh, find out the cause of the stricture before you go ahead with the um, procedure. CT scan is very useful because it helps you in evaluating the mural thickness and also the lymph node enlargement status of pancreas and biliary tract and retroperitoneum. And if it is found to be a benign gastric outlet obstruction, the st standard balloon dilatation is the first line of treatment. And if uh, multiple dilatation sessions fail to keep the patient symptom-free, then you can go ahead with enteral stenting and the latest in use in the endoscopic ultrasound-guided gastroenterostomy with use of uh, luminal opposing metal stents, which is used both for benign and malignant gastric outlet obstruction. 
So this is, uh, these are the pictures showing endoscopic balloon dilatation of gastric outlet obstruction, where in the picture you can see the barium study of patient with caustic injury causing pyloric stenosis. Second picture shows the endoscopic picture when it is uh, at the beginning of dilatation. In the third one, you can see the balloon. And in the fourth one, after six sessions of dilatation, the luminal patency can very well be seen. So there are uh, two types of balloons, the one with fixed uh, dilatation and the ones where you can uh, uh, increase the dilatation with the pressure with which you inflate it. End point in these cases is 15 millimeter and frequency will be from one per week to once in three weeks. And you should avoid it in the acute phase of acid ingestion. And in those cases, it should ideally be done after eight weeks. And hydrostatic balloon dilatation is generally the procedure that is used. Coming to endoscopic stenting, expandable metal stents made of different materials, sizes, shapes are available. And uh, they are a safe and effective alternative to surgical therapy. An advantage over surgical GGA is those of uh, the uh, minimal access surgery, like short operative time, short of hospital stay, and early intake. Disadvantage is decreased patency of stent with higher rates of recurrent obstruction and need for reintervention. Complications would be bleeding and stent migration. And recommendation is that endoscopic stenting should be used in um, as an alternative to laparoscopy or open surgery for patients who are poor surgical candidates or have short expected survival times. Coming to endoscopic ultrasound guided gastrojejunostomy for gastric outlet obstruction, these pictures show how the procedure has been done and the luminal opposing metal stents can be seen between the stomach and the bowel. And a systematic review meta-analysis of six studies, including 484 patients of which 291 underwent endoscopic ultrasound guided gastroenterostomy and 193 surgical gastroenterostomy showed technical success rate of surgical uh, superior over the endoscopic ultrasound guided GE. Clinical success of endoscopic ultrasound guided gastroenterostomy was statistically sim uh, similar to the surgical one. However, the endoscopic the procedure had the significantly fewer adverse events compared to the surgical counterpart and re-intervention rate of both was found to be similar. So to conclude, it uh, has equivalent clinical success and re-intervention rates with significantly lower adverse events compared to surgical gastrojejunostomy. So when feasible, it can appear to be an effective and safe alternative, especially for palliation management of gastric outlet obstruction in malignant cases. Coming to small bowel strictures, there are multiple causes again, right from Crohn's disease, NSAIDs, previous abdominal surgeries. Endoscopic management would be single or double balloon enteroscopy, which would dilate the refractory uh, strictures. Serial intralesional injection of infliximab can be used along with dilatation. Metal stenting not recommended for bowel strictures and biodegradable stents have been used with technical success of 83, but clinical success only 20%. So coming to the endoscopic balloon dilatation, patient should be clinically fit. And if uh, associated, we should not have complications because in case there is complication during endoscopic procedure, patient should be fit enough to undergo the surgery. It should not be performed as an emergency procedure. And the strictures that you should choose for endoscopic balloon dilatation should have a length shorter than four centimeter. Minimal inflammation, malignancy should have been ruled out. It should be straight in line with bowel lumen without any fistula orifice close to it. And if there is a fistula, because in Crohn's you have multiple strictures and there are fistulation also, the fistula should be at least more than five centimeter away from the stricture. And if there, is, there should be no abscess in the stricture area. Again, most uh, common balloon size available for small bowels are 12 to 15. And for the colon ones, it is 18 to 20. And one minute of dilatation should be done. There is no consensus regarding the timing, time of dilatation and a graded versus non-graded approach also, there is no consensus. This is a picture showing the anti-grade balloon dilatation from left to right. You can see the stricture, the balloon being introduced and the post-dilatation picture after a hydrostatic dilatation. This, the, there was a meta-analysis uh, done to show what uh, would be the advantage. 18 studies were included with 463 patients who had undergone 1,189 endoscopic balloon dilatation and it showed a technical success rate of 94.9, major complications in 5.3. Around 48% had symptom recurrence, 38% needed redilatation and 27 needed surgery. To conclude, it was that balloon-assisted enteroscopy for dilatation of Crohn's associated small bowel stricture has short-term clinical uh, technical and clinical efficacy and low complication rate. However, two-thirds of patients need redilatation or surgery. 
Coming to the last part of the gut, that is the colons, colonic strictures can again be benign or malignant. Benign can be due to diverticulitis, inflammatory bowel disease, ischemic colitis, radiation, or due to a procedure that has been done before, like endoscopic submucosal dissection or colonic resection. Malignant ones are due to primary colon cancer or extrinsic cancers compressing the colon. Benign colonic strictures, you can deal with, with endoscopic balloon dilatation and to a lesser extent with uh, stents or endoscopic electrocautery incision or radial incision and cutting for refractory ones can also be used, especially for the anastomotic ones. Malignant colonic stricture, the uncovered stems either preoperatively or permanently as a palliation can be used. For balloon dilatation, again, the technique remains the same. Here, a stricture less than 4 cm in length should be considered. However, up to 8 cm can be taken up for endoscopic dilatation. Again, active inflammation, abscess of fistula should be uh, absent in these patients. And in this technique, you should use you can use a balloon of diameter less than 18 mm to reduce the risk of perforation. And here, again, you can do a, a fluoroscopic guided or uh, through the scope procedure can be used. Uh, balloon should be dilated with a pressure of 35 to 50 PSI and one to four minutes of pressure should be maintained. And this can be repeated one to six times generally. Additionally, there can be injection of tramsilone post dilatation and electro incision using pre-cut papillotome or laser by, after balloon dilatation can also be used for dealing with these structures. These are the various kinds of stents available for colonic stenting, right from covered, uncovered, triple layered and biodegradable stents. And for benign colonic stricture, there is still uncertainty about uh, the indications and timing and positioning and removal of these stents. So colonic stems ins are inserted using either the through the scope, as I mentioned, technique or over guide wire via fluoroscopy. And stent length, again, here should be four to six centimeter longer than the for the obstructive lesion and the diameter at least 24 millimeter. This is uh, just a picture showing the colon stent and uh, in x-ray also you can mark out the stent. This is about the use of uh, insulated tip knives for uh, the refractory strictures. And this is the picture, just like I mentioned in esophageal st strictures, that there were eight incisions made and in between stricture lesions were cut and removed. The same is used for these colonic incision, um, lesions. And the radial incision and cutting here is used in four quadrants and the intervening mucosa is uh, removed. Especially it is used for the anastomotic structure. So the uh, metal clips can act as a guide up to which you can resect the mucosa. Coming to a summary of uh, recommendations for uh, stent placement in GI strictures. The esophageal stents for malignant stricture, it is mostly for palliation. And if there is malignant fistula, then stents uh, placement is recommended for sealing of such fistulas. It can be a bridge to surgery or preoperative chemoradiation. And for benign indications, the temporary fully covered stents can be placed for refractory benign esophageal stricture. And removal of, uh, or, uh, of the retrievable esophageal stent is performed endoscopically by the string and here fully covered large diameter stems can also be considered. For gastroduodenal malignant strictures, it is again for palliation and for benign strictures, we already discussed there is insufficient data whether you can use it, but definitely the endoscopic, the lamps that we talked about that can be used for the endoscopic uh, gastrojejunostomy. Colonic stent, again, malignant strictures, it is palliation and or a bridge to surgery. And uh, if there is external malignant colonic stricture, stent placement does not really work. For benign stricture, the role is not defined. So if we look at the future direction, the spectrum of endoscopic therapies for benign and malignant esophageal, gastric, small bowel and colonic stricture has been broadening. Long-term clinical success is elusive, especially in refractory and complex strictures where you need a combined therapeutic approach which will deliver a better outcome. Implementing stem cell technology and robotic assisted endoscopic approaches has recently been proposed and we are yet to see what it holds for us. Some of the discussed techniques and treatment options which I have mentioned are relatively novel and they need large randomized control trials to assess use of these techniques in real practice. Thank you very much for your patient listening. Uh, greetings from Jim Sherpur. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Arriva. That was a wonderful and a very comprehensive uh, talk. You covered almost all aspects of uh, GA strictures. Now, as you mentioned in the very last slide, the, the challenges in managing the refractory GI strictures. So I guess the next speaker is going to talk about that and help us understand the various treatment options. 
Uh, I will request Dr. Partha Gada to kindly uh, introduce our second speaker for the day. Yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. Our second speaker is Dr. Parth Pal, a consultant gastroenterologist from Asian Institute of Gastroenterology, Hyderabad. He has special interest in IBD and therapeutic endoscopy, and he is going to share his experience with all of us in the management of re refractory GI structures. Welcome, Dr. Parth Pal. Uh, the screen is yours. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity. And uh, I think Dr. Arjuna has uh, largely covered and made my job easier. And uh, after that, I shall discuss the management of refractory strictures, the review of literature and current scenario. So regarding the definition of stricture, so it is a, uh, according to the initial classification uh, uh, described by Kochman et al, in, which was published in GI Endoscope in 2005, is an anatomic restriction because of fibrosis or cicatrization, which ultimately leads to dysphagia. It was originally called esophageal strictures, and there should not be endoscopic evidence of inflammation, and it should exclude neuromuscular dysfunction due to post-operative or post radiotherapy uh, dysfunction that is there. So in that definition, they describe refractory as a diameter in which 14 mm of esophageal diameter could not be achieved by five sessions of endoscopic balloon dilatation at the interval of two weeks. So this was useful for designing future after that different clinical trials and studies. And also recurrent uh, stricture was defined as inability to maintain of maintaining a 14 mm uh, diameter uh, after um, for a period of four weeks. So the number of sessions is not specified in the definition, but that is the number of sessions that needed to achieve 14 mm uh, diameter. Then usually I'm, uh, this is the uh, difference between complex and simple strictures. I'm uh, describing it here because I want to show that the complex strictures are more likely to be refractory, like post ESD, like post endoscopy submuticular dissection uh, strictures, like anastomotic strictures, caustic and radiotherapy induced strictures in the use of acres. They are, these are complex and they, they are the ones which are likely to be refractory. So you need to uh, know what is the etiology of the stricture at the onset. So you can counsel your patients uh, that this patient may uh, turn out to be refractory and you may predict that. And also if the trajectory of the stricture is angulated and there is extensive stricture, long stricture and uh, multiple ones, those are the ones which can be refractory. So this is the approach described by Peter C. Uh, uh, that is published in Gastroenterology in 2019. He has described that endoscopic balloon dilatation of Safari, uh, Safari Gillard Buginage uh, for three to five sessions, if they are unable to dilate this uh, esophageal lumen up to a diameter more than 16 mm, then you don't need anything. If that is not there, then you go to the step two. Then you can either directly go for a incision therapy if you're comfortable with it, or you can go with the endoscopic dilatation combina combined with steroid injections. Any of these therapies should not use more than three sessions because uh, more than three sessions, they, it is ineffective. So they're most likely to recur. So, Endoscopic incisional therapy, all the strictures are not amenable for endoscopic incisional therapy. It should be a little bit elevated and have a fibrotic base so that you can cut out the strictures. Whereas a steroid injection can be done in any of the strictures so, and does not require any uh, specialized learning curve. So uh, as already discussed, the mitomycin C can also be used after steroid injections. Uh, the incremental benefit is not known. And the step three is stent placement. And after that, you, uh, the patient can be uh, uh, taught how to do self dilatation, specifically for those uh, proximal strictures, and finally uh, surgery. So this is the RCT that has already been discussed, I think. But just to show uh, the point that uh, after the steroid injection, interlesional steroid injection in um, esophageal strictures, as you can see in the steroid uh, interlesional steroid group, the repeat dilatation was less, that is 13 percent, compared to 60% in the sham group. And also the time to redilatation as per the kaplan mayer curve is higher in case of steroid group. That was published in uh, American Journal of Gastronomy in 2005. And this is a negative study of interlational steroid injection. In this study that was sh shown in cervical anastomotic stricture after uh, esophagectomy with gastric tube reconstruction in that there was no uh, significant difference in the time to uh, uh, recurrence of dysphagia in these two groups with injection or without injection and this they injected saline actually and 
instead there was increased incidence of candida esophagitis in the group where the in steroid injection was used so should be used cautiously and meticulously and not in each patient because that is not without complications but in our practice i have not seen much of this candida esophagitis and mostly this is safe only but this should be kept in mind then uh, this is the agent that is used triamcinolone acetonide and this is uh, very much available and uh, 40 mg is available uh, per ml and it should be diluted with 1 is to 1 saline the reconstituted solution is 2 ml and 0.5 ml of each solution should be injected among the four quadrants and maximum you can use three sessions so uh, advantages of this is reduced number of repeat dilatation and increase in the dysphagia free period as shown in the randomized control trial and the disadvantage is the increased risk of candida esophagitis but it is very easy to use and there is no learning curve for this and mitomycin c uh, this is, uh, as we have already discussed that is difficult to procure sometime but the dilution and almost is the same it, uh, it is 0.4 mg rather than 40 mg in case of tranexamic the injection is same with the sclerotherapy needle maximum three sessions it reduces the number of repeat dilatation but there is no significant decrease in the dysphagia score as in the uh, study and the evidence is limited to case series and in the pediatric age group it is more used then going to the incisional therapy it is suitable for short strictures and slightly elevated strictures not those flat ones because you will not be able to cut and they should be based on fibrous or scar like tissue you should make four to eight radial intercut surgical incisions over the strictures area you can uh, shave off the intervening fibrous tissue uh, that is called radial incision and cutting technique and maximum session is 3 so the instrumentation that is required you can use a needle knife or a it knife you should know the uh, length of the knife because that can be used as a comparator to because how how deep you should go because um, the as you can see the needle knife the length is 5 to 7 mm so that will act as a, a comparator to guide your incision depth and the setting should be electrocautery setting should be endocut q uh effect 3 cut duration 1 in cut interval 3 in this rb device and uh, the advantage is a good long term efficacy for short anastomotic strictures and not suitable for long non elevated strictures non fibrotic strictures although it can be used in some ulcerated strictures you can target specifically the non ulcerated area but it may uh, may need multiple sessions for long strictures and not superior to sg dilatation for uh, esophageal strictures as per rct This was published in 2009. So these are the uh, um, uh, meta-analysis of different SEMs. That is, uh, next is SEMs and uh, different stents uh, in which there are there can be fully covered SEMs, then uh, partially covered SEMs, and uh, self-expandable plastic stents and biodegradable stents. And as you can see in the meta-analysis regarding the clinical efficacy, the high, as you can see in the study by Canena, they have used all the three types of stents. and as you can see in the same study they have shown that the highest efficacy clinical efficacy was with the sems followed by biodegradable stent and least with the self expandable plastic stent similarly uh, migration rate was the highest for a, a self expandable plastic stent more than 50% followed by sems followed by biodegradable stents then adverse events were um, also highest in the self expandable plastic stent group that's why they have fallen out of favor and uh, now we are using either the biodegradable or self expandable metal stent so these are the commercially available stent the polyflex stent is the only commercially available plastic stent you should know the diameter and the length that uh, of the stent that you are using because that is very important uh, in planning your therapy and uh, fully cover same nts this is available the diameter is uh, 18 to 28 and the length is 6 to 20 cm and is a fully covered sems the advantage of fully covered sems is less uh, chances of tissue embedment but as partially covered stent the end scan uh, tissue embedment can occur and to remove that you may need a stent in stent technique later on with a fully covered sems of a stent same diameter because if you keep that more than 4 to 8 weeks it may get embedded and even in a lesser uh, period of time with a partially covered stent that but uh, that comes with a lesser uh, risk of migration but for fully covered sem there is higher risk of migration but uh, the problem is um, high risk of migration but the advantage is it will not get embedded whereas axial stem can be used for very ultra short strictures uh, because the length is very short the diameter is 10 to 20 but the length saddle length is only 1 cm 
but it is a very good stain for ultra short stitcher. As you can see, the response rate is around uh, sixty-three percent for ultra short stitchers. Uh, whereas clinical success for fully covered stems is 35 to 45 percent, whereas uh, this biodegradable stem, the one, one available stem is LR, uh, uh, SX LR biodegradable stem, which is uh, the lo uh, long term efficacy is 30 to 40 percent. As already been discussed, if the stitcher is ischemic or long, then you have to put it for eight weeks, more than eight weeks. But the ESG guideline they say that the stem should not be kept for more than. 12 weeks to prevent tissue embedment. And for strictures uh, which are due to inflammatory bowel disease, usually most of the studies are used to up to four weeks only. So the main complication with all these stains are migration, and which can be prevented with OTSC or suturing device for fully covered stems. Usually the normal through the scope uh, clips are not that effective in benign strictures. Uh, not uh, as in case of malignant strictures, and also it can cause severe retrosternal pain. And after the removal, there can be recurrent stricture. So, apart from all these techniques, the new technique already poem has been discussed. This is a novel method that is known as paroral endoscopic tunneling for distillation of vagus or poetry, in which uh, usually a retrograde endoscope is endos introduced to the uh, percutaneous endoscopic gastrostomy through which the retrograde endoscope is in, uh, introduced and through the esophagus, you introduce the anterograde endoscope and uh, a submucosal tunnel has ma been made and through that it goes into the completely obstructed tissue and uh, dissects the tissue uh, and after completely dissecting the tissue, puts a guide wire and through that a stent is placed, fully covered sense usually sometimes and uh, that can help in uh, restoration of the continuity of the esophagus. And this is an example, uh, this was uh, earlier described in 2014, as you can see in this uh, fluoroscopic image under fluoroscopic and endoscopic, both anti-grade and uh, retrograde guidance, this is done. As you can see, the guide bar is passed through the submucosal tunnel and through which this uh, sense has been placed. So mostly the indication is oncologic, post radiotherapy and chemotherapy cases, but uh, it still can be done in severe uh, corrosive injury cases, it can uh, salvage surgery sometimes. Then going to the uh, gastric outlet obstruction, these are the causes. I'm not going to discuss them again, but I want to just stress upon the fact that uh, peptic is marked with green to highlight the fact that it is most responsible to endoscopic therapy, whereas caustic and uh, uh, stricture due to chronic pancreatitis, these are <coughs> less responsible and more likely to be refractory to endoscopic therapy. Whereas other important causes are cross disease, which are emerging like eosinophilic gastroenteritis, post EMR and ESD because they are being done more and more. Also, NSAIDs is another important cause and uh, diagnosis of this stricture should be made if the intake is more than three times a week for more than three months. Other uh, etiology like tuberculosis also should be kept in mind. These are also common. So these are the systematic review of all the uh, uh, published studies that are there on uh, use of uh, this endoscopic balloon dilatation in case of gastric outlet obstruction. Uh, you should treat H. pylori infection, stop NSAIDs and smoking because it may not be refractory, but patient will still be smoking or taking NSAIDs or uh, the H. pylori infection is not treated. Long stricture, caustic injection and chronic pancreatitis are less likely to respond and the need for multiple post, uh, balloon dilatation procedure is predictive for treatment failure and need for surgery. So as you can see, this is the Indian perspective. This is the largest data from India that's published from uh, PGI Chandigarh and this is the latest uh, the, Three art publications were there from this center, and this is the latest one. And in this, there were 264 patients. <coughs> As you can see, <coughs> the most common cause was uh, peptic, uh, followed by <coughs> caustic, followed by peptic and medication induced, followed by different systemic diseases like tuberculosis and cross disease. As you can see, the procedural and clinical success was highest for peptic ulcer disease, followed by medication induced and caustic. So, medication induced like opioid or NSAID abuse, whereas, uh, and also caustic, these are less likely to respond to endoscopic balloon dilatation. So these are more likely to become refractory. So refractory gastric outlet obstruction, that is, uh, they have defined as inability to dilate a stricture to a diameter of 15 mm after five sessions of endoscopic balloon dilatation. So usually the caustics are more likely to be refractory and uh, whether it become refractory or not, at the onset of corrosive injury, you can decide on them because if the patient is having acidosis at onset, or a CT is showing uh, the transmural involvement, mostly they will become, uh, may become refractory. Also the endoscopic Zargas classification is 
very high grade, then uh, the most likely they will be, become refractory. Then uh, peptic versus medication. Medication induced, they are more likely to be refractory than peptic ones, and also multiple structures are uh, require more number of dilatations. And these are the factors like caustic etiology, initial dilatation diameter, and dilatation up to 15 mm. If it is not achieved, then chances of recurrence is high, and uh, recurrence and refractiveness is high. Adverse events. Uh, the, like perforation can occur in up to 3.4% cases uh, and it is higher with caustic uh, uh, etiology. As you can see in these cases, you can do interlational steroid injection, but there can be drawbacks like as you, I have shown in case of esophagus, there is candida esophagitis. This is a case report. In a case of post ESD, they routinely inject steroids sometimes into the margins and in this case, interlational steroid injection has uh, resulted in CMV uh, uh, infection in the stomach. So uh, all these injections may have their drawbacks as well. So electroincision therapy in this post-op pyloric stenosis was <laughs> initially described by uh, Higawara in, uh, that was published in GI endoscopy in 2001. And as, a, as usually electroincision therapy, the long-term efficacy is good because this cuts out the fibrotic tissue. The chances of bleeding is higher compared to endoscopic balloon dilatation, but the um, risk of perforation is lower. So as you can see in this case, this is a real life case that I have done. Uh, we have done two sessions of endoscopic balloon dilation, three strictures were there. So even after only in one month, the patient used to recur and come to us. Sorry, I wanted to show the video. So this is the, uh, so that's why the patient was planned for stricture to me and we are cutting the fibrotic tissue with the knife, with the IT knife. And we have made this four to eight radial incisions. And uh, until now, more than eight months follow the patient is fine. You can also additionally cut out the fibrotic tissue, but we did not do because it was duodenum, first part of duodenum. So high risk of perforation was there. Additionally, you can put clips in between the cut areas that can act as spacers to prevent reapposition and also it can prevent delayed bleeding. So this is the evidence for fully covered cells for pyloric stenosis. The stent diameter and stent length can vary from 18 to 20 diameter and the length can vary from uh, 60, uh, 6 centimeter up to uh, 20 centimeter as well, uh, <coughs> according to stent that you are using. The migration rate is very high. That's why you need specifically designed stents for uh, this indication. Uh, the, the migration rate is almost 62.5%. Short-term efficacy is good, 80 or more than 80%. Partially covered stents has also been used for a benign structure. Usually this anaro stent or NTS partially covered stent or bona stent have been used. I'll uh, discuss them. And already be, already, uh, this has already been discussed that sometimes US uh, gastroenterostomy can be used. Usually they are used with a, a special EPAS balloon in our center in which there is two balloons, uh, which are initially the distal balloon is dilated followed by the proximal balloon. In between the fluid is injected and uh, from under endoscopic ultrasound guidance, we puncture that from the stomach into the part of the uh, jejunum or and or the duodenum and the uh, this lumen opposing metal stents. But the drawback of this technique is the diameter that you achieve can be cannot be more than two centimeter. That is less than the surgical gastroenterostomy. The, that's why it is mostly uh, used for malignant patients who are having less life uh, life expectancy, but can be used in benign etiology. It is, uh, it, the studies have shown that it is feasible, but whether it is really needed or not needs a head-to-head trial because the drawback, only drawback is the diameter is uh, actually, the actual diameter is small actually. And also, this, um, although the procedure looks very simple, but it can be complicated and it is contraindicated for multiple bubble structures. It cannot be done if the structures are multiple also. So uh, then going to small bowel structures, the etiology may be different like inflammatory bowel disease, neoplastic, uh, then Crohn's disease. Uh, uh, most common is Crohn's disease followed by tuberculosis can be there. Uh, another one is cryptogenic multifocal ulcerating stenosing enteritis, NSAID induced or other causes. So uh, the most common causes Crohn's disease associated structures and this is the uh, systemic review and meta-analysis which is showing 18 studies of this many balloon dilatations as, and they have shown that the technical success is very high uh, for the small bowel structures with clinical success rates are also good. The recurrent symptoms occur in almost 50% of the patients and that is recurrent symptoms in half. The rule is half for recurrent symptoms 
and two third require redilatation or surgery. So that should be kept in mind. So this recurrent symptoms are higher in case of gastrointestinal strictures that are there for Crohn's disease. And these are the predictors of outcome. Although uh, it has been shown that uh, Crohn's disease is an inflammatory disease and the international steroid and TNF injection uh, should be uh, beneficial in this case of strictures. But uh, in um, multivariate analysis, they have lost significance in um, predicting success in, in this uh, success of endoscopic balloon dilation in these patients. Rather, uh, ethnicity, location of the stricture, pre-steroidic dilatation, and medication at dilatation were more important. So this is the, our approach uh, that we use for Crohn's disease stricture. Uh, if it is a, uh, we can use this Bacardi risk score. Uh, you can refer to this article. I'm not going into details of this. If the uh, length of the stricture is more than five centimeter with pre-steroidic dilation, you directly go for surgery. If there is inflammation, you optimize medically. If the length is less than three centimeter, you can either go for an endoscopic balloon dilation or stricturotomy. If there is no head-to-head -head trial between the two. If the length is three to five centimeter, you can go for an endoscopic balloon dilation directly. If there is failure, you can either go for a stricturotomy, if not done earlier, or a stent placement. For longer stricture, you need a fully covered cells. A shorter stricture, you need a partially covered, or a uh, shorter and distal stenosis, you need a, a lamps. Uh, we have registered this uh, uh, balloon versus endoscopic stricturotomy trial in Crohn's and we are recruiting patients for that. And this is our uh, <coughs> experience. Uh, we have uh, this is in uh, press, and we have uh, almost uh, done 87 dilatation in 46 patients, and even uh, that can help in avoiding surgery in few patients. Uh, <coughs> you can see in this ileocecal and uh, sigmoid stitches. They were initially dilated and they are later on controlled with medical therapy and until now they have avoided surgery. So in our series also the recurrent symptoms were higher in the gastrointestinal stitches and one of the cases we have done is stricturotomy. So uh, usually in stricturotomy you need extensive training and the length of the stitches should be smaller and it should be specifically elevated uh, type of stricture and the long term efficacy is high. Bleeding rates are high, although the perforation rates are low. And as you can see, you can uh, cut a non uh, ulcerated area in a five, uh, mixed stricture, whereas both inflama uh, uh, this inflammation and fibrosis is there. Uh, in those cases, mostly the anti-mesentic site in Crohn's disease ulcers is the um, opposite wall of the linear ulcers. It is cutting on the anti-mesentic site is good. Because even uh, producing a mesentic abscess will cause more morbidity for the patients rather than producing a uh, free, mes uh, free perforation. So uh, potential landmines should be kept in mind, like uh, esophagus and duodenum is zone 3, where the complications can be uh, detrimental for the patients. Then zone 1 is ileocecal junction and the rectal stitcher and the pyloric stitcher, where you can be little aggressive. Small bowel and anal canal strictures, uh, the complications can cause significant morbidity. And post-operative anatomy should be kept in mind. As you can see in this high ileocolonic anastomosis, the consequences of iatrogenic perforation would be similar to a duodenal perforation. So the post-operative anatomy also should be kept in mind. I'm not going into details of this. Already been discussed that strictures have been, uh, if the stricture distance from the fistula is more than five centimeters, still you can do a dilatation in case of IBD. And also the location is important, even if the stricture is refractory, as you can see in this patient, this patient keeps coming back, but this is a patient of, uh, who has earlier underwent a repair for a rectovaginal fistula. We are hesitant to do a incision on the anterior wall because uh, usually the, uh, on left lateral position, uh, the uh, vagina and all the uh, uh, important organs are on the anterior side. So the patient is not... Uh, accepting the risk of uh, this reopening of the rectovaginal fistula we are so still we are maintaining with endoscopic balloon dilatation so discussing with the patient is also important low flow oxygen fluoroscopic guidance is important but you may not use a fluoroscopy and usually you should stop uh, warfarin and prednisolone uh, those should be tapered to less than 20 centimeters in these strictures and these are studies between that compared between balloon versus night and also uh, this, uh, stricture tomy with uh, ileocolonic dissection for anastomotic stricture for Crohn's disease. And these are the different stents. Almost the similar stents have been used that are used in uh, other uh, GI stenosis. That is the Nitius enteral cover stent, Hanaro stent is a partially covered stent, Agrio stent, which is a lumen opposing stent, and a biodegradable stents. So, and overall, the technical success is 93%, clinical success is 16%. 
on the migration rate is very high that is 44% and uh, pain abdomen uh, requiring removal of the stent uh, is almost 18% of the cases so it should be kept in mind that uh, stents uh, they are not only good sometimes migration and pain severe pain can occur and this is a only a randomized control trial which is compared between balloon, uh, this balloon versus upfront placement of stents for uh, cross these strictures and they have shown that need, need for additional intervention on one year was significantly higher in the case of fully covered stents. So endoscopic balloon dilution is still the uh, preferred initial mode of therapy and uh, stents should be used for only the refractory cases. Although maybe, not, maybe we are not able to generate the uh, specifically designed stent for each of the diseases for cross disease also in other uh, G-luminous stenosis to treat this. And uh, while treating an IBD stricture, you should keep in mind that patient may be having steroid, maybe on steroids, the nutritional status may be poor, there may be uh, issue at the complication site, may be inflamed, fibrotic, and the bowel anatomy may be altered. So these are the different types of electro incision has, that has been described. It's already uh, radial incision and cutting has been described. Sometimes because this radial incision and complete circumferential cutting can cause defect like ESD. So selective cutting can be done like in this pin hole uh, keyhole like uh, selective cutting can be done that has been described by some other author and uh, it, uh, this can be used as an additional therapy to endoscopic balloon dilatation and this has been compared to endoscopic balloon dilatation for uh, rectal anastomotic structures and uh, technical success in case of uh, colonoscopy or the small bowel uh, structures is usually to, uh, to pass the colonoscope beyond the structure that is 13 mm colonoscope post dilatation it should be possible and if after even after five sessions of EVD, it is not successful. Uh, it is recurring. It is it can be called a refractory uh, stricture, although there is no uh, definition like in case of esophageal or gastrointestinal uh, strictures. Then uh, these are the anastomotic stricture. These are the uh, uh, meta analysis of studies uh, which have used the fully covered stems, and the results are good. And these are the summary of the evidence for lamps for gastrointestinal strictures. Everywhere it has been used, esophageal, gastric, duodenal, and colonic, but it should be ultra short strictures. And uh, as you can see, the clinical success rate and long term success rate are good, but the problem can be stent migration and uh, sometimes stent angulation as well. Electroincision therapy has been used for uh, colorectal strictures, anastomotic strictures as well. And uh, I'm not going to repeat this again and again, but uh, very important is you should be ready for troubleshooting because there may be perforation. And, uh, and also bleeding. For bleed, minor bleeding, you can just dilate the balloon again or uh, sometimes put, uh, use 50% uh, dextrose, which can hyperoscular glucose, which can use as a uh, hemostatic agent. You, can, you should be having through the scope and over the scope tips. And uh, for uh, treating perforation, sometimes you can put a Riles uh, tube and uh, just observe. And uh, sometimes you have to put this OTSC or through the scope tips. And all, for all these procedures uh, for refractory stricture, you should have intervention radiology and surgical backup because after strictectomy, you may not be able to control the bleeding with your endoscopic clips and there may be perforation that not may not be uh, closed with your, uh, even with the OTSCs. So when the uh, smaller perforation, as the uh, size of the perforation increases, you can use a OTSC, use a loop and clip technique or endoscopic suturing. But uh, finally, all these techniques are uh, technically difficult to learn and uh, only sometimes the suturing can be only be possible in distal bowel because you have to introduce the device. But uh, as you can see, there is a lot of uh, advancement in the technology. Uh, I can foresee that uh, this treatment of the respective structures may slowly move from the surgeon's knife to the endoscopic balloon to the endoscopic knife over time. So the take home message is the etiology and length of the strictures are the primary determinants of refractiveness of GI strictures. Interincision injection, electroincision, and luminous stents are options for treating refractory GI stenosis, except in case of small bowel, reachable only by endo endoscope. Choice of therapy should be based on stricture of patient characteristics and available expertise. Long term success can be achieved in up to one third to half of the patient using these uh, therapies, avoiding surgical intervention. The endoscopic should be aware of pros and cons of each modality, which should be conveyed to the patients. Troubleshooting plan and surgical or interventional radiology backup should be ready. So thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Patha. Wonderful, excellent. 
almost covered all aspects and uh, really enjoyed the talk about the management of the small bowel structures. So the session is now open for uh, the Q&A session and panel discussion. So uh, I see that Professor Vishwanath has already raised hand. So uh, Professor Vishwanath, please go ahead. Thank Your you. comments, queries, please. Uh, yeah, it was excellent. Obviously, it's a huge topic. A lot of con you know, ifs and buts. And uh, uh, I'm you know, um, uh, sort of grateful to both speakers, Dr. Path and Dr. Verma, to cover um, a GI tract structure. So, um, just to sort of uh, you know, focus on just uh, three things. Uh, biodegradable stents is something which uh, obviously is a, is a cost attached to it. And certainly uh, in our experience, uh, we, we have uh, published uh, a best trial. You can just uh, relate to it at some stage for benign refractive structures. Certainly there is usefulness in decreasing number of interventions, number of dilatations, number of um, uh, 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 admissions to the hospital. So that's something which uh, has to be sort of touched upon. Uh, and if the cost comes down, it will have a huge implication on patient's care and quality of swallowing, which is something very difficult to measure, whether you are in the East or the West, but uh, that's something which I would sort of emphasize. Um, and uh, recently I was in a, a world webinar on Archimedes, Archimedes strengths for biliary structures, for example, although we did not cover today, biliary benign structures. So similar principles holds good. Uh, it, something which uh, is in my heart is bougie versus balloon dilatation. They're not much huge, but observationally, over the last 30 years I've been doing, in my opinion, for mechanical structures, probably bougie is a bit better than balloon, besides the costs which we covered. Um, I, I, you know, I, I would welcome uh, any of you who have lost experience in the bougies and how often you see the patients coming back to you. The third point, which I would like to put in a focus, is nearly 20 25% strength migration. Obviously, you know, how we can mitigate it through various mechanisms is a challenge. Um, and nowadays, especially the last three, four years, uh, um, we started using stent fix, which is OTS, which Dr. Partha covered nicely in the last few slides. Is again is challenging and, uh, and, and something to consider, but obviously, these are. A metallic permanent fixation. Therefore, it's very important to um, uh, uh, consider this in a, a patient population with a malignancy, unlike benign structures. So I think these are three points and it's very, you know, uh, contentious and complex topic. And, uh, and I, again, uh, thanks for giving the opportunity to share from UK. Thank you, sir. Uh, Dr. Satish, Dr. Ravinder. Any comments? I, uh, yeah. Yeah. Hi. Uh, it was both talks were very good, and uh, both the speakers have covered the topic very nicely and in uh, great detail. I congratulate both the uh, presenters. Thank you, Doctor. So uh, yeah. Uh, uh, one, yes, sir. Please go ahead. Yeah, one other thing when we do the bougie uh, dilatation, we usually follow the rule of three. In the bougie, uh, the, the rule of three is that once uh, you find the resistance with the, the diameter of the bougie, uh, the minimum, uh, the bougie diameter, which gives you the resistance, from that diameter onwards, you, you add up uh, one mm each and you can go up to three mm more. So that is the rule of three. Yeah, I think that's a very, very important point, especially for the beginners who are planning to start their dilatations. You always remember the rule of three to just keep you safe, avoid all the unnecessary perforations there. And uh, I see a couple of questions have been posted from our attendees. So I'll just put them forth and uh, uh, the speakers can try to answer them. So the question from Dr. Prakash Walse is, will balloon dilatation help in gastroparesis, which is not responding to medicines? Any ideas, comments? Balloon dilatation in gastroparesis. It depends on uh, what is the mechanism of gastroparesis because some of the patient may have this functional obstruction of the uh, gastric outlet. Uh, those patients will benefit from balloon dilatation, not all those patients, but the mechanism of gastroparesis may be different. Yeah, so basically, it's only in mechanical gastric outlet obstruction not, related not to gastroparesis. Um, sometimes this... Uh, uh, Gastroparesis means where there is mechanical, no mechanical obstruction, but there exactly. may be functional obstruction. Sometimes functional obstruction in the 
uh, gastric outlet and uh, the mechanism underlying mechanism can be that and rather than okay. inadequate propulsion in those those subgroup of patients based on uh, this uh, this gastric emptying study or other spe uh, specialized studies you can diagnose those patients and specifically those are the candidates for a balloon dilatation or even uh, this uh, power uh, this uh, gastric poem also they are doing gastric poem in this patient basically right. the functional obstruction is at the level of pylorus and they are usually uh, they, they do well with the dilatation usually so i hope that answers the question so another query is uh, is there any some specific material for specific conditions as far as the stents are concerned huh? so, I'm, I'm, so what basically he is trying to ask is uh, do you use some specific stents made out of some specific materials uh, for different uh, indications uh, actually uh, there is no uh, such specifically designed stents for uh, separate material for different indications but maybe for uh, that is a food for thought very important question because in, uh, like in uh, case of inflammatory bowel disease you need a stent which uh, which has less foreign body reaction so that will cause uh, less tissue hyperplasia like that kind of thing so that is a uh, area of research that can uh, so uh, stent material that can cause a less tissue reaction uh, that that may be useful in this those case of inflammatory strictures but as of now i guess we just have the nitinol metallic stents and yeah. the plastic ones yeah. and the recent biodegradable ones which are coming there are okay. also some drug eluding stents and also they are also available for malignant cases so depending upon what the pathology is you choose your stent and also as i mentioned the availability is important the structure of the lesion that you are dealing with all that is important and yes it is already a research topic which stent is better than which in which condition yeah. that is already on very good very good now uh, i have a i have a question which i would uh, like your comments upon is so i would be i basically am interested in the gastroenteral anastomosis so stenting basically in a case of gastroenteral anastomosis after a partial gastrectomy or something now the challenge basically is the the longer the, the the over the guide wire stents we basically can't reach that distally the sheath is less uh, short in length and uh, through the scope stents basically the, the problem there is that they are basically narrower in diameter the maximum probably being 18 i guess so how do you manage how do you manage these gastroenteral you know anastomotic uh, structures which are developing uh, i mean repeated uh, uh, dilatations or cres again increase the risk of perforation so that seems to be quite a critic i would like to know your opinions and the experts and panelists if it is not reachable by endoscope yeah no no reachable by endoscope but if you can't put a stent across it you know normally they are usually long so even the right. uh, lamps are out so how do you manage these ones the long i think in that case is uh, this incision therapy is not going to work as well yeah so so what's the safest option according to you dr arunima would you like to come Uh, there are two things i think even if it is a long stricture and you know usually we do a contrast study or something before we go ahead and a fluoroscopic guidance is taken see i agree with dr vishwanath that i i am also a person using boogies i use boogies more than it is also cost effective but at the same time for long stricture especially if it goes refractory i think you have got longer stents available so longer stents in those conditions would be a good option Yeah, the and, uh, is not, yeah, the challenge is with the diameter. The through the scope stents which we are talking about now yeah. we have a diameter which is very less. So, so that's the challenge actually. So I think again, like we use serial, I think uh, the gastroenterologist would uh, comment more on that because what we have seen is that uh, through the scope uh, diameters, when it is so small that you have even been able to put the through the scope, which is not a very big diameter nowadays, it is removable. You can go in for the next one as well. It is not that okay after one stenting you cannot go in for another stenting. Uh, am uh, I right, I... Doctor Goel and Doctor Pal can answer that? I think the yeah. diameter is actually eighteen to twenty eight can be used. I mean. so that is good enough uh, which is uh, to relieve any kind of symptomatic obstruction yeah even uh, sometimes you can put the colonic stents there in the enteral area if you need more diameter yeah. you can 
colonic strain is also that, that that's will, wonderful that, that, that will migrate, migrate into the bowel distal bowel that will be a problem yeah yeah but it has more diameter sometime uh, i have put also in uh, but they are more common but in that case uh, the proximal end can be secured or something uh, can be uh, secured so that it can does not migrate Right. Thank you. So, uh, any, any, uh, Dr. Partha, this, this is for you basically. So, uh, can you just elaborate upon the use of uh, lambs or uh, stems for the small bowel structures? Also, uh, for small bowel structures which are not visible by endoscope or colonoscope, I don't think yeah. uh, these lambs or any kind of stems should be used. So, usually, this stem should not be used for small bowel structures because most of them are. Angulated and then very difficult to place, and if that migrates, then that may cause a small bowel uh, obstruction. So, usually in small bowel, we we don't do it. either incisional therapy. Also, we don't do because the perforation rates uh, it will cause uh, morbidity and uh, same the high risk of migration is there. Mm -hmm. Right, and there is high chance of obstruction. If the, and most of these uh, structures are angulated, so. Very difficult to pass, and most of the endoscopes, although the current spiral endoscopes are uh, gives good stability, the balloon endoscopes, the single or double balloon, uh, the st scope stability is also not very good. So putting those uh, uh, stent is very difficult. And how about how about is, US US guided lamps? Uh, one one point I that I wanted to highlight here is for incision therapy. Uh, can only be done in those places where the scope shaft is straight and the tip is under control. So only with an endoscope or a colonoscope of a diameter where the tip is under your control, you can do an incisional therapy. So that's why in small bubble incisional therapy is also out. Then what is the next question? No, I was just uh, asking about the US guided lamps placement for small bubble structures. Uh, US guided lamps for small bubble obstruction, uh, usually no. Usually okay. for gastroenteric anastomosis only it is used, and usually those small bowel uh, structures there are usually multiple. So usually they are multiple mm -hmm. because uh, most of them are due to cross sinews. So in those cases, balloon dilatation is the safest if the number of structures is less than four and they are closely situated. The rest of the cases should go for surgery only. Right. So that basically, you know, draws a line, but this is. This yeah. case is uh, good for surgical, and this is this this should go for endoscopic management. That's what I wanted to know. And also another yeah. problem with small bowel uh, small bowel structures is you cannot do again and again this uh, endoscopies because they are very costly procedures and uh, doing three four times endoscopies is equal to the cost of surgery. Even sometimes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Pat. So any other queries or comments from the panelists? Let me just go through the questions. Uh, there's a question. Uh, I think this, uh, which limb of gastroenteral anastomosis should you put the stent? I guess that's what he meant to ask. So it's, it's obviously going to be into the efferent one. I hope that answers the query there. Another question is about the corrosive ulcers in the esophagus. Should we dilate it or not? Dr. Anima, would you like to take that? The corrosive strictures are the most common indication for uh, esophageal dilatation. And that is where we discussed about the balloon and the boogie dilatation. And then you do three times dilatation. Caustic dilatation actually respond well to uh, boogie dilatations. But yes, when there are those... Uh, uh, complex ones at times you can face challenges when you're not able to negotiate your guide wire and in those conditions maybe that you know if there are multiple points then you can use go ahead with the balloon one but i have uh, had the good success rates with the dilatation right so uh, just to clarify the question uh, and the and the uh, the topic about the question the problem is that he is asked about the corrosive ulcers so i guess you do in not dilate the ulcers yeah, so we don't dilate the ulcers, we dilate I, the strictures. Yes, we dilate the strictures. So that I think I did mention that uh, you should yeah. give eight weeks time minimum for it to develop fibrosis and then go ahead with. Even in uh, when you have a uh, you know intake uh, corrosive intake, 
then also the endoscopy can be done very gentle endoscopy by very experienced endoscopist otherwise even endoscopy yeah. should be avoided during the phase very right yeah so i guess that there are no further uh, questions in the chat box so we'll just have the final comments from the panelists and uh, then i'll request dr partha to anybody have, give the closing remarks. anybody have yeah. experience with endoscopic incisions how how often they use endoscopic incisions you mentioned so i think dr partha pal can elaborate on that endoscopic incision therapy only i i have used for refractory strictures because you have to counsel the patients as well because the consequences sometimes can be uh, detrimental like severe bleeding can occur which can lead the uh, angio embolization as well because you don't know after cutting what will happen because the rates of bleeding can be as high as 6 to 10% so only for refractory strictures upfront in few patients who are having uh, anastomotic or so very short strictures less than 3 cm strictures you can use if you have the expertise because but lot of training is required for that before you attempt that thank you now uh, i would like uh, dr partha i would like to uh, just just for the sake of the, the younger surgeons who are planning to start their dilatations and uh, stentings how do you prevent migration of the stent how do you uh, do you fix the stent in some way uh, can you just elaborate on the use of oviscos uh, for uh, malignant strictures some yeah, to prevent yeah. stent migration basically yeah for malignant strictures usually they are very tight and uh, through the scope clips can be useful but usually for uh, benign stricture you need uh, otsc that has to be used and the proximal end it should be the suction should be done and uh, the uh, the jaws of the otsc one jaw should catch the esophageal wall another jaw should be catching uh, the part of the stent and uh, other other option is you can use the endoscopic suturing device to suture uh, the proximal end of the stent yeah the apollo was just there that's another option so i would just like to mention that uh, the migration can also be prevented for the fully covered stents where the incidence of migration is much more even there why we can go ahead and put these uh, ovesco clips because although they are metallic clips but there is a device which can break the clip and ultimately we can enable us to remove the stent whenever you want to take it out okay so dr patha i think uh, i also have learned a lot because uh, in this and because i mainly deal with ibd strictures but uh, we routinely do other stricture dilatations as well but uh, i think uh, while reviewing the literature i i also gain a lot of knowledge and uh, with uh, this uh, good discussion and all with the surgeons uh, this was a nice experience thank you for thank you yeah hello yeah dr gadu please go ahead okay uh, so i thank everyone for attending this meeting uh, it was a very fruitful session where we discussed all about the benign and endoscopic structures and its management and uh, as a young surgeon i learned a lot uh, i have sent the link to the uh, feedback form i request all the participants and the speakers and the panelists to uh, fill this form uh, which will help us decide uh, uh, our future course of action uh, the link to the whatsapp group and the youtube channel is also available Uh, on which uh, we will upload all the lectures that uh, we conduct on tux endoscopy and this meetings uh, recording will also be uploaded on that channel in a few days time uh, and uh, all the participants uh, will also receive a certificate on email after a few days uh, the next uh, meeting uh, the tux endoscopy meeting is on the first sunday of every month uh, on the same time so the next uh, meeting happens to be on uh, the 6th of november uh so for the details uh, you can for the, for the details we, you can join our whatsapp group and uh, also on the uh, tugs and uh, tugs uh, email uh, subscription you will get the further information so we thank you all for joining us today thank you dr gada and thank you all the speakers and the panelists uh, dr vishwanath yeah, professor vishwanath had to leave early because of some uh, urgent work and we thank him we thank all the speakers dr ravinder dr partha Dr. Satish, Dr. Arunima, thank you so much for taking time out on a Sunday evening and sharing your experience with us. Look forward to see you again. Thank you, Dr. Bhalla, for inviting me. Thank you. Thank you.
Yeah. Thank you so much. Good day. Thank you. Thank you.